Amid reports coming out of Bangladesh last week was the story of a seven-year-old boy who had hung himself. He's said to have become fascinated by the noose after seeing it over and over again on the television. It's a grim consequence of the country's fierce political battles. The grey cylinders of Taka's parliament building have long tolerated political bickering. But for the last month, this has spilled out into the streets and as a result, more than 100 people have lost their lives. It's a result of this, a domestic court which has been set up to try alleged war criminals in Bangladesh's 1971 liberation struggle. The men in the dock stand accused of committing murder, rape and forcing Hindus to convert to Islam. These are harrowing allegations against some of the most respected scholars in the country's Muslim ranks. The government says it's fulfilling an election promise which sought to bring closure to a horrific trauma. The opposition accuses it of carelessly opening a wound that threatens the stability of the nation. In our special report on Bangladesh tonight, we ask, are the defendants getting a fair trial? Is this really about delivering justice? Or is this courtroom an orchestrated chess game where the government gets to call all the moves and wipe out its enemies? One member of cabinet actually stated that anyone who gives evidence for Saidi will be considered to be a traitor of the nation and will be dealt with by the public accordingly. So that's the kind of environment that we were forced to operate under. The banner for the International Crimes Tribunal looks anything but impressive. As if hastily put together, it stretches above an area where security men monitor entrance to the court. Critics say the tribunal itself has been set up in pretty much the same haphazard manner. Since its creation in 2010, it's been mired by accusations of political interference and sleaze, not the kind of justice you want from a court hearing some of the most historically significant cases. In 1971, the then East Pakistan fought a bloody independence struggle after accusing West Pakistan of centralizing power. In the nine months of fighting, Bangladesh says three million of its people were killed and 200,000 women raped. Roughly eight million Bangladeshis were displaced. But the scale of the Pakistani army's attack can't be explained with just numbers on a screen. In the summer of 1971, India's then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi embarked on a campaign of what she described as personal diplomacy in Moscow and the European capitals. She told a British newspaper editor it was to prepare the ground for India's armed intervention. The strategy worked, and on December 16th, Bangladesh, with the help of India, celebrated independence. The war was to deepen regional hostilities between India and Pakistan, but in 1972 the three countries signed a tripartite act known as the Simla Agreement, in which Pakistan diplomatically recognized Bangladesh and the nations laid down the principles upon which future relations were to be governed. The Simla Accord made no mention of prisoners of war, but a 1974 supplementary agreement paved the way for repatriation. Subsequently, Civilians captured in East Pakistan were released and over 90,000 Pakistani military prisoners of war returned home. Among them 195 officers accused of war crimes or genocide. These men never stood trial. Forty-two years later and it's as if it was all just yesterday. Bangladesh <laughs> The so-called war criminals these protesters are talking about are not the Pakistani army officers who were allowed to walk free, but a group of Bangladeshi men accused of collaborating with Pakistan during the war. It's all part of the ruling party's election promise, in which Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina of the Awami League party 
pledged to try anyone responsible for war crimes. But opposition parties say the tribunal is a political tool which is designed to crush anyone who doesn't support the government. But unfortunately, Sheikh Hasina has taken a very rigid line. She is not listening to any side, any complaint or any sort of uh, appeal. She is determined and all these, uh, you know, the tribunals, and uh, it was prefixed, judges, investigators, prosecutors, they had some sort of a political affiliation uh, with our milik and uh, this is what the opposition parties are complaining. Bangladesh's various political parties all accuse each other of having members who are war criminals, even the ruling Awami League party itself. But the people standing trial are only members of the opposition, which calls into question the government's real motives. Perhaps the most shocking names are a group of conservative men who belong to jamaat e islami the country's largest Islamist party. The group campaigned against the independence war, but denies committing any atrocities. It's a key ally of the country's largest opposition group, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. The men at the center of this so-called trial are household names, renowned for their knowledge of Islam and respected throughout the world's Muslim communities. They include Delwar Hussein Sayyidi, a 73-year-old scholar who joined the party in the late 70s and who's previously not been listed as a suspected war criminal. Prosecutors said Sayyidi was involved in the deaths of three people and that he'd led the Pakistani soldiers to kill dozens of others. They also accuse him of forcing 150 Hindus to convert to Islam. Sayyidi, who was a teacher at the time, denied all the accusations against him. Indeed, he's previously won two election victories in a largely Hindu area. Last month, he was convicted and then sentenced to death. The decision sparked off protests across Bangladesh and beyond. He has been convicted to the highest as uh, a death penalty, and the other out of 20, uh, eight charges have been proved uh, without uh, reasonable doubts. Sayyidi's case raises particular alarm for human rights campaigners who say the death penalty shouldn't be used in a case which hasn't been fair. One of the most concerning, for example, is the use of the death penalty. We oppose the death penalty in all circumstances because of its cruel and unjust nature. But even more so, when you have the death penalty, the fair trial has to be um, absolutely correct. And in the cases of the ICT, We've seen a few issues. Do you know what? I received a phone call only a few days ago from a leading member of the current government, governing party. And I asked him, is Dilwar Hussain Saidi guilty of any crime? He said, no, we believe he is not. But in the interest of the Bangladeshi national, uh, uh, or in the Bangladeshi national interest, we must hang one or two people to set examples. Earlier this year, the tribunal sentenced a former Jamaat leader called Abul Kalam Azad to death for crimes during the war. Several weeks later, and another Jamaat leader was sentenced to life in prison on similar charges. Abdul Qadir Mullah's life imprisonment would prove to be an inadequate judgment for the government, and it hastily changed legislation to allow the prosecution to appeal the sentence, this time calling for the death penalty. After, at least in one of the cases, um, a death penalty wasn't imposed, even after someone had been found guilty. Um, the government has changed the law. So it's changed the law now to allow itself the right of appeal um, to have the death penalty. And this breach is one of the most fundamental rules of international justice, which is that you cannot have the law changed after the trial or after the event, especially on the death penalty. It's thought the government did this to appease a group of demonstrators who are calling for the Jamaat leaders to be hanged. They're being called the Shahbag protesters after the area they've occupied, and they're made up of young Bangladeshis. Many were not even born at the time of independence. Our movement is going on, and it will be keep on going until our demand is fulfilled of the descendants of all criminals. Six other top party leaders are currently on trial, including the 90-year-old former leader and founder of Jamaat Islami, Ghulam Azam. His son is a Manchester-based former sports journalist. Salman al-Azami has fond memories of a father he says is consistent in good character and patriotic at the core. In 1971, he could have stayed silent, but he didn't because he was patriot. He didn't want the breakup of his own country. At that time, for him, 
Pakistan was his own country. So he was a, a patriot to let Pakistan stay as a united country. And now if Bangladesh, someone wants to break away from Bangladesh, what would someone um, you know, uh, do in Bangladesh? They would want to remain united Bangladesh. So that was his purpose at that time. Ghulam Azam stands accused of committing crimes against humanity at the ICT. He's accused of giving orders to kill, but he maintains there's no evidence to support this, as he's never held any type of military position. The court trying him was rapidly set up a year after Sheikh Hasina took office. The government says it's called the International Crimes Tribunal because it's international crimes that the court is hearing. Outside of that, there's nothing international about the setup of this tribunal. The government of Bangladesh has been widely criticized for keeping this an entirely domestic affair with no international oversight whatsoever. The trial was Bangladeshi trial. Tribunal that was formed to try them was a Bangladeshi tribunal which will take account of local crimes as well as crimes that are known as international crimes, which is mass exodus caused by mass killing of people. It's an interesting concept, but it hasn't proved to be as straightforward as that. There's nothing to prevent a country from setting up an institution such as this. Um, many would say that they have an obligation to do this, and they should have done this 41 years ago. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, but there is nothing international about it. There is no involvement of the United Nations. There's no involvement of the international community, no funding, no assistance. Um, it's, it's a specialist tribunal that, that falls outside of the law. It doesn't fall within the usual judicial constitutional hierarchy uh, of, of Bangladesh courts. Uh, it excludes domestic law. Uh, it only applies a, a specialist statute that was adopted in 1973 the position that we have always advocated. Before the trials really got started, I traveled to Dhaka in August 2011, and I was denied uh, an entrance visa. Um, I was held at the airport for 10 hours, and I was then deported and told uh, very clearly not to return. No. On what basis? Um, on the basis that I was representing war criminals. That's what, that's what I was told. Anybody who is not a member of the court cannot appear as a lawyer in that court. I go back to 1970, uh, 60, uh, 1969, when Bangabandhu Sheikh Mojibur Rahman was tried by Pakistan army for sedition. We sent a lawyer, Sir Thomas Williams, QC MP, to Bangladesh to uh, appear on behalf of him. He was not allowed. He was allowed to advise. And he did that while he was there.